Hi there. Come on in. I'm Fred Trost. You know, we've been traveling around the state going to deer camp and all over on Michigan Outdoors. But tonight, we're back in the Michigan Outdoors cabin. We have our trophy report, a recipe. Uh, we're going to talk about Indian fishing with Howard Tanner. Talk with Fred Bear up at Bow Camp. Oh, what else do we have? A steelhead fishing, handgun silhouette shooting, oh, so much more. Stay tuned. Sit right there because it's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history. Well, this is the afternoon at bow hunting camp up in Houghton Lake, the invitational hunt up here. It's open to the public this afternoon. A lot of notable people here, including none other than Dr. Howard Tanner, director Thank you, Fred. of the DNR. Thank you. What do you Let's think see. of this? It's pretty nice. I, first one I've ever been to. Are, are you uh, a bow hunter? No, I'm not a bow hunter. I'm a rifle hunter, and I have a muzzle loader. Why not? Uh, that's a good bow. question. I feel like if I ever took up bow hunting, I could waste about two to three weeks out of the year, and I just don't have that kind of time. Waste? I used a bad word. <laughs> you there. used a bad word there. But I don't no, have it, the time. It does take commitment. That's right. You have to take a, a stick and a string like this and launch an that's arrow right. out there. That's right. It takes practice. You'd have that's to practice right. probably a half hour a day for it. You got that yeah, kind of time? I don't have that kind of time. Uh, well, what? Or at least I don't think I do. So. Are you fishing and hunting as much as you used to? It goes in spurts. This summer, I fished more than I have in years. Uh, I fished last weekend, by the way. I fished uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. For salmon? Steelhead. How was it? Well, the fishing was great. I caught one steelhead. But I had quite a few steelhead on, so fall colors, nice oh, stream. I know. It's great beautiful. weekend. Great. It's beautiful. Well, what about, uh, I hate to bring this up, but uh, what Go about ahead. Indian fishing? You, you said over and over, we're just around the corner. Just around the Listen corner. to the next press conference. All right. We're going to have it all solved. Well, I could repeat that. Uh, Why don't you try it? From a factual <laughs> basis, uh, yeah. they have a very, very formal detail proposal from us. They've had it about two months. And uh, Monday or Friday just passed. We got their very formal response. I haven't seen it. It's being analyzed, and so they're going to lay our paragraphs and their paragraphs side by side and to see where we are. I would tell you that those who have looked at it Lee Gilt give me very much optimism. So are we farther away than you thought yeah, we were before? Yeah, yeah. So, But I've got to read it before I can say much more than that. But they just have told me that the differences are enormous. So. Hmm. Well, that's a disappointment. Yeah, it is. Uh, but, uh, but take it for what it's worth, a preliminary report. And uh, I still believe that the desire is there on both sides to settle. And we'll work on that, and hopefully it's still just around the corner. You know, I haven't, I asked you this question because I haven't been up on it. Because, mm -hmm. frankly, I'm getting tired of it. Well, uh, I, Do you find that this is the response? People are just getting upset and bored and tired? And, uh, and it's, not a, it's not a good subject. Uh, people would... If they have other things to do, would rather go do them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's pretty important. And uh, uh, the other part of it is, it's been pretty quiet for a couple of months. We've mm -hmm. just been waiting, I believe, for two months for their response. So, but we have it now. I, I won't even it. ask you for a projection. Should I? I mean, is this well, going to drag me, on? Let for me say it this way, and I'll give you an opening for something else, whatever you want to go to. I think it's going to be a problem for the next governor to deal with. It's going to go beyond the first of the year. Well, you've met a lot of the bow hunters yeah. here. What do you think of us? Great bunch. All Great right. Punch. Good answer. Good answer. You met Fred Beard today? <laughs> sure. Talk with him? Well, let's yeah. go talk to him right now. Okay. See what Fred does. <laughs> I, I remember in 1937 when we had our first bow and arrow season. That was it. We had two counties, Iosco yeah. and yeah. Nuevo. Yeah. We had, I believe, 193 bow hunters yeah. at that time. 193. 193. And uh, I'll have to ask you how many we have now. It's over 214,000 last year. 214,000 last year. Killed 33,000 deer. Yeah. 33,000 deer. What percentage is that? My mind is uh -oh. not working. 14 to 7, about, no, that's better than that. 33, uh, 30 percent, uh, 
15, yeah, it's closer to 12, 13%. That's what yeah. I thought, yeah. 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 Okay, well, yeah. That's, very, that's darn good. That's good. That's picked up, yeah. And the uh, bow hunters have gotten better, or the equipment's gotten better, or what? Yeah, and well, the deer have certainly gotten smarter. Since we've been hunting in trees, they go around looking in trees, do you they know. they really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they do, though. That's I'm good. not kidding you. And um, I have a couple of friends, the Vernon Brothers from Marble Falls, Texas, who make the wild game call. Yeah. They were the first, as far as I know, to hunt from trees. Mm -hmm. And the deer got so they walk around looking, looking in, trees in trees all the time. So what do they do? They put dummies up there all summer <laughs> in the blinds <laughs> to get used to it. And <laughs> come deer season, they get in there themselves. That's the way they licked it from. Well, a white tail that lives uh, from Canada clear to the Panama Canal and maybe farther south has got to be a pretty adaptable animal. Well, uh, he certainly does. And uh, people ask me so many times, what's the hard hardest animal, the toughest animal to hunt and to kill? Mm -hmm. And they're just surprised when I see the white-tailed dealer. And I've mm -hmm. been all over the country, and they are the smartest. Mm -hmm. they, there's no question about it. Be. And, you know, um, I shot a couple of turkeys. That's a common thing, you know, turkeys. I shot a couple of turkeys out in Nebraska well, this 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we live in Florida. And I've been hunting those Florida turkeys. And those Florida turkeys are native, and they are smart. They and are. I thought for a while, maybe I'm not right in saying the white-tailed deer is the yeah. smartest of all to hunt with a bull. But then I had a couple experiences. Um, they don't have a nose. They've got a bill. They can't smell you. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And they can be called. Mm -hmm. That's, That's right. So those are the two yeah. weaknesses. So yeah. the white-tailed deer is still, still the smartest. The toughest, yeah. yeah. He can live right no, in your backyard and you don't know he's there. And I suspect we have as many uh, white-tailed deer hunters and particularly white-tailed bow deer hunters in Michigan as anywhere else in the country. No, Pennsylvania's got your beat. Have you? By 100,000. By 100,000. Yes. Well, we've got something to work for, haven't we? You've got something to work for. And I don't understand that because their success ratio is only 3 or 4%. And how they people can keep going out hunting with such a low success ratio, I don't know. But it sort of bears out the point that maybe uh, it isn't what you get. It's uh, fun of being in the yeah, woods. Yeah. And that's what, really what it's all about. Yeah. When you get something down, that's when the work begins. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I could listen to that man talk all night about bow hunting and deer hunting. He has some great tips. You know, he's gotten his share of big bucks, but if you think this year you might get a big buck, be sure to stop by the DNR, write to the DNR, write to us here at Michigan Outdoors. We'll have our address coming up during the recipe segment. But they have a big buck award contest. You can pick up the entry form here. It tells all the rules, regulations, how to go about it, because we are going to have, right here on Michigan Outdoors, our big buck night on December 2nd. We're going to, all the big bucks we can locate through the DNR's Big Buck Award Program, we're going to get down here at least the top 10 or 15 so you can see what they're like. That's December 2nd, so put that on your calendar. Well, I know a lot of you have written in to us and called the Travel Bureau about these handgun silhouette shoots because you just want to go out and give it a try and see what they're all about. This is your chance this weekend. The guys who put it together, right. Jerry Moran. Thank you very much, Brad. Skip Dodson. Brad. You guys are really instrumental in, in getting this sport going here in Michigan, and you're the ones who really were behind this uh, celebrity super shoot as a fundraiser for us at Michigan Outdoors. Well, there's a lot of other people that have helped, and most definitely one person can't do it all. And we have a lot of people that are coming down, and we're going to have a great time. Well, I'm sure we will. Remember the feature we did last summer where yeah. I had my first introduction to handgun silhouette shooting, and I was using Jerry's gun, a uh, 357 Magnum, first time I had ever shot. Uh, uh, well, really a big bore gun of that caliber. Uh, I was shooting at targets right here. I think I was shooting at the pigs. Oh, yeah. What was that, uh, 100 yards off? 100, 100 yards, meters. 100 meters. 100 meters. I never would have thought that I could have hit a target that small. That's about, what, a foot high, eight, 16 inches eight, high? Eight inches. Oh, that's eight inches yeah. right there? Eight inches. And I, I popped off several of those. You did. You did very well. And, you know, people can come out and listen to this comment by a girl who had never shot a gun great. before. <laughs> So is this your first time shooting? Yes. I've never even held on to a gun. Well, what's your score so far? Ready? Well, I got four out of five. Four. Whoa. Okay. You kind of like this sport, do you? Yeah, it's fun. She was having fun. And if you folks would like to come out and what, take a shot, take five shots with, Most definitely. with, with, with any of these types of guns, There's they'll have an opportunity. There'll be guns there for people to take the opportunity. The, um, going to be some pretty difficult shooting, though, too. Now, right, some of those targets uh, are a long ways off, 200. 
okay. meters away for the Rams, but you're going to put the 22 targets. These little 22 targets. Right. You're going to have a 200 meter. Oh, that's right. This particular target right here has been especially made just to shoot big bore. They're hardened steel, oh. and they're going to be placed at the same distance as the large bore target. This is two fifths the size of the other target. Oh, at 200 yards with at a handgun, 200 open meters. iron sights, celebrities. Right. You got the world champ coming up from Ohio. Right. Joe May out of Ohio, Michigan State champ will be there. As a matter of fact, that this show is aired in his district in Ohio, and all the people down there are really excited about Great. it. Yeah. Well, that's super. Of course, we'll run through real quick. There's uh, door prizes, raffle items, uh, guns, uh, books, shooting glasses. Right. How, what, what's the value of, of the prizes? Right now, we have uh, up to $1,500 worth of prizes. There's more prizes mm -hmm. coming in each day. What a time it's going to be. That's Langsburg. That's northeast of Lansing, off Upton Road, off I-69. Join us out there. You guys, we're going to have a good time. Well, we're hoping that uh, a lot of people are going to show up, and we've got a lot of response so far. I'm sure they Great will. Well, let's take a few minutes now to change the subject a little bit and go fishing with Gary Marshall of the East Michigan Tourist Association. He's going to show us how you can catch steelhead in the fall. Well, normally what I wear is uh, I wear the red wool for my hunting uh, outfit, and I also have a pair of insulated underwear. So I have my insulated underwear, I have my red wool pants, and then I put the waders over it. And unless uh, it is uh, raining hard or snowing hard, or if you take a little bit of water over, over your uh, waders, you'll find that uh, this will probably be warm enough to weather any of the, the icy, chilly, cold water at that time. Gloves, now that's, there are, I've tried all kinds of gloves. Probably the best method uh, is not to use gloves. Now this is, uh, this is really cold, but uh, I've tried cotton gloves where I've, I've uh, cut the fingers off. I would have to recommend that this will work. Uh, just a pair of old brown inexpensive cotton gloves with the tips of the fingers cut off uh, will kind of keep the wind from uh, biting your hand. And this is my kind of fishing. You don't need the expensive boat. You don't need the downriggers and the graph. Uh, actually, all you're using uh, will be, as we mentioned, a pair of waders and, and a, a rod, something in the oh, eight and a half to nine foot class. Uh, open face spinning reels, closed face work good. So I would say that just about uh, any type of rod or reel, I've seen all kinds of combinations, but just a, a nice, comfortable rod that a person may use, bass fishing or, or pike fishing can also be used for catching steelhead. The terminal tackles, uh, when you talk about main line, you're gonna be running this is the line that is on your uh, reel. Now, this will be hooked to a, a two-way swivel or a three-way swivel utilizing the egg sinker or the uh, sliding uh, sinker. From there, you'll probably want to run about uh, six feet, maybe eight feet of uh, some four pound if you, if you want to try the four pound, or you'd want to uh, maybe stick with six or eight pound. Hook size, uh, I usually use anywhere from a 10 to a 12, uh, and again, this depends on the style of the hook. Uh, there's many different styles, many sizes, but it's a relatively small hook, and you'll find at this time of year that the fish don't peck, peck, bite, bite. They, they inhale the, uh, the cluster of eggs. So you don't have to worry about the size of the hook because when you when you hook the fish, usually that small hook will do the job. My way of, of fishing uh, steelhead is to use spawn. Now spawn comes three ways. Either you get them tied up into a spawn sack, uh, you use chunk spawn or, or clusters they call it, or the single egg method. Now the single egg method is a very deadly method. This is just using one salmon egg on a hook. Uh, treble hooks is another way. Uh, number eight, number ten treble hook is a way that some people can take a, uh, a cluster of spawn and put it uh, on this hook. You, you more or less embed the hook into the cluster. Uh, and just throw it out and let it lay on bottom. Uh, this is an excellent way of, of taking fish. Uh, it, generally this time of year, the fish are, as I've mentioned, are close to the river mouths and try to fish in the current. Look at the current. See which way the current is flowing. This will be determining on which way the wind is blowing. Uh, the fish will have a tendency to be hanging around in the flow of the stream. This is the area that the fish will uh, be hanging. Uh, if you're in an area that, uh, let's say, is rocky, or maybe we've got some weeds that's laying on the bottom of the, of the lake, take, uh, take these miniature marshmallows and take this marshmallow and you bite it in half. And you take a part of this marshmallow and you put it on the hook. The biggest effect is the flotation. This will float it up off the bottom. But if you're going to use the marshmallow with spawn, be sure that you have a small uh, BB shot or some type of weight, oh, three, four, five inches up from the hook. Because without that, the marshmallow will float the bait right up to the top of the water, and so uh, very few steelhead will take it off the top, or they will take it on the bottom. When a, when a uh, steelhead of, of size anywhere from four, six, and into November, now we're going to be talking, especially up Platte Bay, uh, we're going to be talking uh, steelhead up to 18, 20 pounds. 
And you may be just sitting there holding your rod. Uh, there are people that will put them in rod holders. I prefer to hold my rod because I want this field fish to, to come in and grab it. And it's almost like uh, you've hooked into a torpedo or, uh, or a small whale because when they hit it, they, they're on immediately. They, they're out of the water, they're on their tails, they're jumping, they're splashing, they make some fantastic runs. Uh, and this, uh, this is why I think the steelhead is, is ranked so high among all the fish. You know, they're an excellent fighter, they're a flashy uh, fish, and above all, they're excellent eating. Catching a trophy steelhead like this one we have on the wall is a real thrill. In the spring you can catch them, in the winter, but at this time of year, really around deer season, these fish are energetic in the streams like you won't believe. Let's go back with Gary Marshall, back up into a stream. We didn't do so well surf fishing that day, but we'll go up into the river and you're going to see what an incredible battle a steelhead trout in Michigan puts on. You have so much enjoyment after catching a fish like that, it seems like you wouldn't deserve anything else. Right, Cheryl? Right. Well, Cheryl Smith can take fish like that, even if they fought a big battle for you out in the stream, and turn it into a real delicacy. We, in fact, you brought along some, looks like coho salmon to mm -hmm. me. All of you have heard about the uh, Wisconsin fish boil, a great way to cook fish like this, but your specialty is herbs. 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 But you have a little, a little roadside stand that you call Urban Herbs? Urban Herbs. Urban Herbs. It's herbs. Right. Okay. Urban Herbs is the name of her little roadside stand, and you have started growing and selling fresh herbs in the summer. Right. Saved a few for us to, to do a recipe that you call Herbed Salmon Boil. Never heard of this. Now let's see what we put in it. See, we have four quarts of water boiling. Right. What's the first ingredient? Okay, we have about a cup of leeks. It took Ooh. about... Leaks. Two leeks this size. If you haven't seen a leek before, this is what that is. Sort of, sort of like an onion, mm -hmm. a big onion. Okay, a cup, cup of leeks, chopped leeks, three to four tablespoons fresh parsley. Okay, like this. okay. if you use dried parsley, how much would you add? I would use about half that amount. Are, are the dried herbs and spices stronger? Yes, they're stronger mm. than the fresh. Okay, and here we have some fresh chives. Great on mashed potatoes. Not mashed potatoes. Well, yeah, mashed potatoes. Mm -hmm. Baked potatoes. Baked potatoes, whatever. Sour cream. So that's three to four teaspoons of fresh chives. And a sprig of thyme. Thyme. Well, that's how it's spelled. Thyme. Right there. But it's pronounced thyme. Thyme. Okay, and this is a sprig. Mm -hmm. Never seen this before. They don't, in the stores, they... Well, that, you don't commonly see thyme available no. fresh in stores. And you just drop that whole sprig right, right in there. So now, you can after this, you can say you've served thyme. One well, uh, could say that. Could say, but not in Jackson. <laughs> okay, a bay leaf. Ah, this is a fresh bay leaf. Mm -hmm. Is that? Do they, they taste better than the dried ones? I think so. You grow those in your garden too? Well, no, I just have one that I grow for my oh. own use. They don't grow well in our cold climate here. So. Okay, we have a third cup lemon juice and about one teaspoon of celery seed. Boy, this is really a, a concoction here of, of herbs. A uh, quarter teaspoon of pepper and four teaspoons of salt. That's the difference. The old uh, Wisconsin fish boil uses a lot of salt. 
Mm -hmm. really yeah, no this herbs. is much less salt. Now it says here, boil all of this for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Boy, that looks like it'd be a good soup. Well, you can smell it already. It smells really good. Mm, and the longer it, it sure boils, does. it releases more of the flavors. Oh, the boy. And... Well, this is going to be great. And then what we'll do is after 15 minutes, mm -hmm. take the basket, put the fish in. You use a filet, not a steak. Right. You like, like, the, like it filleted like that? Okay, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do, Cheryl. We're going to let this simmer here, and we're going to be back in just a moment with a finished product of mm -hmm. uh, Cheryl Smith. She's from Lansing, herbed salmon boil. You're going to want to taste this in just a minute. But right now, Cheryl, let's talk about some big fish we catch here in the Great Lakes with our trophy report. Now, here's a trophy and a half. It's not a Great Lakes muskie from Lake St. Clair. This is a northern muskie from Gogebe County in the UP. Walter Bloom from Waukegan, Illinois, caught this 31-pounder on a live sucker from Little Oxbow Lake. That's a trophy to be proud of. But if it's good eating you're after, you can't do much better than walleye. This one evidently was cruising with the salmon because Richard Youngblood from Jackson was trolling a number four green and black ladderback J-plug in Manistee Lake when this 10 and a half pounder hit. A lot of nice walleye have come out of both Manistee and Muskegon Lakes on the west side this year. You should try for walleye there sometime. Now, what is this fish? Well, the humped back and hooked nose make it look a lot like a pink salmon, and it might be. But if it is, at six pounds, it's a new state record. DNR fisheries experts think it's really a deformed king salmon, but they're not sure. So Joe Brady's mystery fish is at U of M right now being identified positively. We'll have more information on what this fish really is next week. Steelhead trout can also be caught out in the lake from boats, not just in streams like Gary Marshall showed, but at this time of year, streams are generally better. Now, Glenn Kemmerly took this 16-pound, 12-ouncer off Osceola County, trolling with a grizzly plug earlier this fall. Now, here's another one of those fish that hit the wrong lure. David Kretschmann from Goodell's was still fishing a spinner with a nightcrawler in the St. Clair River at 8.15 in the evening. Obviously, he was fishing for walleye, but the 16-pound, 5-ounce steelhead grabbed his lure. Well, you saw how steelhead fight. I bet that David was mighty surprised. I give this trophy a good up-and-down look. A 16-pound, 4-ounce steelhead that came from southwest Michigan, the Galeen River in Berrien County. It hit on a spinner for David Perkins from Grand Rapids. Now, that's a great picture, and along with being a great fish, we'll make Dave Perkins our Michigan Outdoors Master Angler of the Week. Boy, those trophy pictures look nice, but it's hard to find a prettier-looking fish than this right here. Served herbed salmon boil. Cooked up by a very pretty cook. Also, Cheryl Smith from Lansing has the shop Urban Herbs. And what we had in the pot here were chives, parsley, uh, leeks, thyme, celery, seed, bay leaf, lemon juice, salt, pepper. Oh, great recipe. And this fish cooked for how long? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, Eight and minutes that's it. Pound. And how do you serve it? What's your... Well, with the boiled potatoes, and then you pour a little melted butter over it. Mm, with lemon on the side. Yeah. That looks absolutely scrumptious. Now, I'm interested to see how this tastes. I'm going to nip a little off the end here, because the Swedish fish boil or Wisconsin fish boil uses an awful lot of salt, and you only had about four tablespoons. Four teaspoons. Teaspoons? Mm-hmm. Mmm. Mm. That is really scrumptious. In fact, it's so mild. Mm-hmm. Mmm. And the herbs, they don't distract at all. No, they add. Add. Blend well with Come on in here. You're going to want to try some of this. Oh, I do. Well, look what else I've got. I've got some pictures that? of Cheryl's relatives, and uh, this is some of the fish right here. Oh, where were they caught? Pentwater. Sure. Pentwater, that's where your family fishes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looks like some browns and uh, mm -hmm. steelhead, salmon. That looks great. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a terrific recipe. Ed, how'd you like to have some? I would like to. Can I try some? Well, yeah, just a moment. i got one job for you to do. Our folks out there who want this recipe, Cheryl Smith's recipe, can order it. I want to announce that um, this is the last Michigan Outdoors program of the year. Next week, we start a new year. How about that, guys? Yay! Okay. So join us for, the, for that edition of Michigan Outdoors. Also, I want to close this show with a few comments about the coming election from Bob Garner, legislative aide of the House Conservation Committee, and Howard Tanner, who I asked how things have been going. Things are going very well, Fred. And uh, a lot of people might not believe that, but, but they are. Uh, the, the department is running smoother, 
uh, we may have less money to spend, but everybody's trying real hard, and and my my life personally is uh, is just working real working real great as far as the department's concerned. I uh, I have the same questions anybody else does about the election, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll wait and see what happens. Well, what's coming up in the legislature? It are we going to have a tough year? Sportsmen are going to have a tough year ahead this political year? Well, they're going to have a tough year because a number of their uh, proponents for hunting and fishing are leaving the legislature. Uh, Tom Anderson, uh, chairman of the Conservation Committee for many years, is, is gone. Uh, uh, Kerry Cameron over on the Senate side. Uh, John Hertel, uh, who is the Senate chairman of conservation, he's gone. Uh, a lot of the real tough proponents for, for uh, firearms, for the right to, to bear arms, are going to be gone. And uh, those people that are very uh, pro-hunting are, are just uh, are gone. So right now, if you have candidates out there that uh, come knocking on your door, ask them the tough questions about hunting and fishing. Make them know that there's, uh, that, there's that big constituency out there. And then you'll be heard.